are watching Property TV. Hello and welcome to Property Matters. I'm Stephen Galpin and with me today is David Gelwin, Sales Director of Galliard Homes. Welcome, David. Thank you. Well, David, you started down here at the same time as I did, about 25, 30 years ago, which I suppose makes me very old and you're a little less old. I'm so probably just as old. But, um, but there we are. We, we've, we've seen a lot of changes down here. I started off at... Um, Tower Bridge, where um, I worked for Sir Terence Conran doing Butler's Wharf, and that was really the start of the Docklands regeneration, I think. And your company came in very much at that time, didn't it? Well, we came in uh, very early on. We've done a number of developments within the Isle of Dogs, Wapping and Tower Bridge. As you know, we, we did quite a lot at Butler's Wharf at the time when we took it out of receivership and mm. con constructed some of those schemes ourselves and sold some of the off after the master plan was created. Um, so yeah, we've, we've always liked the area. We like a bit of regeneration and there's nothing like Docklands for regeneration. Mm. I think um, one, one of the things that, that, that um, I, I noticed down here, we're now starting to demolish buildings that are less than 25 years old uh, and redevelopment. Um, do you think that's a good thing? I think in the long term it will prove to be a good thing because as you and I have discussed, we need more property, we need more housing where there is a structural shortage of of property in London and the southeast in the main and you can't spread out so you have to go up so small low-rise buildings need to go to make way. Yes although I suppose the development for Docklands started at Tower Bridge and worked sort of inward to what we call Canary Wharf now I suppose as a, as a private estate here um, and, and the sort of buildings on the periphery of that. Um, I don't know whether it was just poor design those 25 years ago where the government said, well, you can build whatever you like and um, do whatever you like as long as it's within building regulations. Um, do you think that's, the, that, that's think, the main thing? I think there was a little bit of poor design and there was a little bit of, let's take advantage of these tax breaks as quickly as we can mm -hmm. and put up buildings that, that we can start trading from quickly mm -hmm. uh, without perhaps much thought to the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that's changed now. Well, I think, you know, Canary Wharf in a way is sort of victim of its own success, isn't it? I mean, yes. I can remember them sort of moving down here at that time when Canary Wharf was first opened and the malls were first opened. I mean, it, it was a weekend, for instance, it was a ghost town. There was no one here, that's right. Now, I, I, I resist going down there at weekends because it's so, it's so busy. It's become a destination from mm. a shopping point of view uh, and a leisure point of view as well. Mm. It really has become a legitimate postcode, hasn't it, to consider if you're moving to London or moving around in London, whereas perhaps in the early days it, it was very much a, a sort of financial centre and geared to that. So I, th I, I think the appeal of Canary Wharf has broadened. I think dramatically, so many of the owner occupiers that are here now that are living within the area um, don't necessarily work within Canary Wharf. They might work uh, in the city itself, or they might work, work anywhere else, work from home even, unfortunately, these mm -hmm. days. Um, but there is still an appeal to be here. So it's not just because you're working here. Yeah, well, it's very clean. It's very fresh. It's, it seems to be very secure. We have very low crime rates here. So that, that's all good news. What I want to talk to you, though, in, originally, we had a lot of um, overseas investment in the, in the residential buildings here caused by people at the time like me going out to Hong Kong and Kuala Lumpur and Singapore trying to sell property to the to the Asian Pacific um, air areas and your company too was, was quite strong in that field. Wasn't we, were, it? we were very strong in that field we still are to an extent but we're perhaps more international these days and more worldwide um, but one of the reasons was that you to be able to fund the development, to be able to actually build the development, you needed to achieve pre-sales. And the only way to achieve pre-sales in those days was to take a scheme overseas and perhaps sell 40, 50% off plan uh, to savvy investors, if you like. Mm. But the reality is that was still providing housing because, it, because those investors would invariably let them out, assuming they completed on them and 
gave an opportunity for someone to move into a, a brand new sparkling yes. block. Having been in various development situations, I think I think I've found that yes, the banks were very keen to have you sell forty or fifty percent up front. You then get back and tell the bank you'd done that. The bank would then say, "Ah, oh, yes, but these these are not UK nationals, so they're all a bit uh, suspect in terms of completions. Can't you go and get some sort of?" British buyers and you go out and you get some institutions to take two, three, four, five floors. And then of course they'd say, but you've discounted these, so your figures aren't very good, are they? So you sort of go around in circles here. The banking and funding of these developments is a complete conundrum. It, it's it's crazy. You do you quite rightly say the bank will say to you, before I give you any money to build it, you need to sell half of it, knowing full well that you're going to sell it off plan and mm -hmm. overseas and therefore to investors. And then when you sell the rest of it, maybe 60% of a scheme could be investor-led. The banks at the other end of the chain wanting to give mortgages to your buyers, they'll shy away from it because it's investor-led. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the two parts of those banks don't speak to each other. No, it's no, a problem. No, quite right. How, how do you think the percentage has changed? I mean, back in, in the early days of going abroad, I mean, it could be anything up to sort of 70% that was, you know, foreign investment-led. Well, is that still the case? It isn't the case uh, anymore. So I, I have always run the UK sales operation for Galliard um, and been involved in the overseas stuff. But um, I used to be very jealous of the 50, 60, 70 percent sales rate that they would achieve and say, why have you left? Uh, why have you left me with with the rump to sell back yes. here? Those days have gone and it seems to be around about 50-50 now. Um, and it's a much slower off-plan market, but that's because of the amount of schemes that are going over to the Far East to try and be sold. Right, okay. And in this business of, uh, of selling off-plan, are you finding any difference in the percentages of people that were buying for investment purposes as opposed to buying for a home? So it's starting to uh, come to the fore now that people are prepared to look sort of six to 12 months in advance for their actual home and will buy that off plan. The issue that you do get then is of course, um, an owner occupier will think, well, can I ask the developer to change this? Can they, can they do this bit of different specification for me? And of course, none of us like change. No, no. Well, you've done your budgets, haven't you? You've well, set precisely. your specifications. Yeah. And, and, you've, and you've probably ordered everything, so. Yes. Yeah. So when you, when you have um, people who are buying for their home, do you find any uh, uh, difference in their attitude to questioning the price, questioning the delivery dates, that sort of thing? Or do you, do you prefer to sell to the overseas investor who's probably a little bit more laid back about what's actually happening day to day? There's, there's two ways of looking at it. It still is a great feeling when you hand over the keys to someone that's bought it for their own home. Mm. And especially if it's their first purchase. And you, to see the genuine excite, excitement within them is, uh, is a nice feeling for, for, for my team. Uh, in respect of what's easier to deal with, Yes, I guess selling overseas is easier to deal with because it's a little bit uh, hands off. Hmm. OK, I mean, I, I, I think the worry that I always have for young people buying off plan is that, you know, it takes quite a clever chap to understand what their finances are going to be in 12 or 18 months time at the end of a, a project when it comes to completion. That's the difficulty, yeah. Hard, hard to gauge. Yeah. And I mean, you know, when I bought my first home, for instance, it was it, it was really quite simple. You'd, you'd go and see your local building society manager. He'd know your area and he'd know where you work and he'd know your company. He'd have all the local knowledge, so he'd be able to tell you more about you than you, you knew. <laughs> and you sort of ended up getting a bit of paper which sort of said, look, all things being equal, um, you know, we're prepared to give you a, a, a mortgage in the December allocation or whatever. And you'd hop off and you'd go and see Barrett's or Wimpy's or, so, or somebody and you'd show them the bit of paper. They'd be very happy at that and say, yes, we'll take a reservation on that basis. But it's not that way anymore. You don't have this local knowledge. Everything's on a point system for financing, yeah. isn't it? So it takes quite a brave person, I think, to buy off plan in this country. I tend to agree with you. It's, it is much more difficult. And you're right, that, that local effect just does not exist anymore. I mean, people will be, people will first of all shop around for their mortgage and just look for the cheapest and best option for them, or perhaps the option that, that, that they qualify for because they may not qualify for certain, certain mm. options. Mm. So it is more difficult, I agree with you. Mm. Help, help to buy has helped considerably. 
uh, with owner Well, I'm going to stop you there. Has help to buy helped you or help the buyers? Oh, I, I, <laughs> I think there's an interesting conundrum again in help to buy. There is a, there's an argument to say for a period of time, everything that should have been priced at 550 was suddenly selling for 600,000 pounds because that was the limit. But people forget that the 650, 670 priced range doesn't exist anymore. You can't price anything at that because someone will come in and say, well, I'm helped to buy, I can only pay 600. And guess what? You'll sell it at that. So mm. it is swings and roundabouts. It has helped us. Mm. It's helped all developers. But I think it's helped millions of people get onto the ladder. Do you? You really do. I genuinely do. And I think that the government will have to look at something else to replace it because without it, there's going to be some difficulties. Well, David, the only trouble is with that sort of conversation is that it's not the government, is it? It's you or I as taxpayers True. that's going to be paying and subsidising these house purchases. So I'm a little bit cautious about that view and I'm a little bit cautious. We've had so many housing ministers in the last 10 or 12 years. I think we've had now 13. And I, I, I just fidget when I hear government interfering in the housing market. I want the housing market to be sustainable on its own. I tend to agree with you that it should it should be sustainable on it on its own, but it's quite difficult. I think in London it probably is sustainable on its own, but it's in the uh, it's in the outskirts. And you know there was there were recent reports of huge price rises in, in values of property based on the based on the stamp duty holiday. Mm. wasn't so in London, um, and and you can't be you know, we shouldn't be tarred with the brush of of, of a house builder in the Midlands that, that's able to uh, take advantage of help to buy. It's very different down here in London. It's, it's also down to volumes of sale, isn't it? Obviously, it's sort of in, in, in the home counties and the further you spread out, the sales rate seems to go down in terms Correct, of yeah. time and speed. So it's a very difficult thing to subsidise and support, isn't it? It's extremely difficult. Um, I think personally, I actually think that the banks need to be doing an awful lot more in, in how they're helping purchasers get onto the uh, on the ladder. They're, they're making it very difficult to get mortgages at the moment. Well, I have this theory, David, that I think that, um, you know, the way to sort good lending out is to say to the banks, look, if you give a 25 year mortgage, you've got it for 25 years. There's no selling it on. There's no packaging it up as the Americans did and, and selling it off. And that would actually sort out the the good lenders. From they the might have lenders. to charge a little bit more for doing that, but then that might be more sensible anyway. Yeah. Well, I think um, I, th I think whether you, whether you buy a house or not shouldn't this depend on a one or two percent differential, should it really? No, you should be able to pay to, to be able to pay your way. Absolutely. Yeah. You can't. It can't be that close. All right. Well, on that note, we're going to take a break now. So join me again when I'll be asking David more about the Docklands boom and the developments down here in Canary Wharf. You are watching Property TV. You are watching Property TV. Hello and welcome back to Property Matters. I'm Stephen Gelpin and I'm joined by David Gelman from Galliard Homes. Uh, welcome back, David. Um, David, Developers Bain 106 agreements and social housing commitments and things like that. What what has changed over the last two or three years? I know that 106 agreements have been relaxed to some extent. What, what are you finding the major changes are and are they helpful? Uh, are they helpful? Well, I suppose we have to say they're helpful because... Uh, You'll get no more. Exactly. <laughs> they are what they are. Um, you have to start these days at, a, at, at assuming a 50% social housing rate and then coming back down to trying to negotiate it down to around about 30, 35%. I do personally, and I think we think as a company and, and all developers do, that, that local authorities have just absconded their, their, their responsibility in respect of providing housing and throwing it all at the developer. Um, and we're there and we're prepared and, and happy to uh, to create it, but it, 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 it becomes difficult. And I think what the general public aren't aware of is that whatever we build social housing wise, we make absolutely no money on it whatsoever. Mm. And in fact, you might make a small loss. Mm. But I mean, I... <laughs> I've struggled with these these 106 agreements. I've been involved with one development where they wanted to take the whole of the footprint of the building for, well, they were Boris bikes at the time. Um, I don't think I could find that many people that wanted to ride a Boris bike. I mean, it was just ludicrous, and it was it was almost a 10 million pound footprint. Yeah, I can I can you I know. can I can well now, imagine. 
I mean, it's all very well saying, yeah, the developers can afford it and this, that and the other, but it's not the developers that pay it, it's the people that buy the flats well, because the end, it just gets divided up, doesn't it? At the end of the day, it's going to uh, cost cost more money in the purchase price of, a, of, an, of an apartment or a, or a development. Yeah, absolutely. So, so are you finding that the social housing requirements actually gone up? It has gone up, definitely, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. The, the, the current mayor would love to hit 50%. I, I don't think anyone's going to give him 50% because we'd rather say, actually, we won't develop. There's there's a lot of talk about developers holding on to land and, and not developing. Yeah. I don't believe that to be the case. I think the reality is the pre-start conditions and the 106 and all of that, it, you can get planning permission in 2020 and not be able to start till 2021 because of all the pre-start conditions yeah. that are associated. You see, when I look at um, developments around here, for instance, and ones that you will know very well, um, I look at one building and it's got washing hanging out on the balconies, push chairs, prams, bicycles, toys, whatever else, all huge fire hazards as we all know now, only to our cost. Um, and then you have the building next door, which is entirely in private hands, which is well managed, nothing on the balconies other than things that should be. Um, how, do, how do we get a balance of this management? Because it, it the two styles of management are not compatible, are they? No, they're definitely And not. yet, if you listen to the mayor's office or anyone, they'll say, well, we want no differential. I mean, if I go back to Ken Livingston's days, he, he wanted the two mixing on the same floors, didn't he? Pepper potted, basically, yeah. was what he was looking for. You're right. It, it, it's difficult. None of us should... Um... None of us should be wary of, of, of who the Housing Association and local authority tenants are because they're the same as you and I yep. at the end of the day and, and, and no reason why they should they be They deserve afforded. housing and Ab homes as much as anybody else. Absolutely. But I think where you've hit upon it is that the management of those developments by whoever they are, local authorities, housing associations, people who perhaps um, they're not in it necessarily for the money and therefore they don't really have the same care and attention going forward. Mm. We, I'll give you an example. We, when we're selling a private development and we've got housing association alongside us, which we're building for a housing association, mm -hmm. so that they do all look the same and they look pristine and clean, we always say, part of the specification, we want to put matching blinds in every single window of the housing association flats. As an extra, at our cost, we won't be charging you. And I've had many occasions where the HAs have turned around and said, no, no we don't want you to do that. And their, their reason is because if it breaks, they've got to go and repair it. But my argument is so you would rather see newspaper and blankets at a window yeah. than a new set of blinds. And their answer is, well, yes, we would. Yeah. It's very difficult. It is very difficult. I mean, there's a building just outside here, which is a 70 story tower. And I was just discussing with uh, one of our people last week as we were looking out the window. Just look at the different window dressings. And you have, you've got blinds that don't fit. They're halfway up the window. You've got newspaper, brown paper in some cases, one thing or another. And, and yet you've got a, a building that's been designed by one of the country's top architects. Um, and it, it, it saddens me, really. I mean, I know we shouldn't live our life by aesthetics, but we do to some extent. I, th I think, unfortunately, we all do. And in this day of the digital age and social media and and all of that, we we do. I, I was um, uh, I was on the radio with uh, Mr. Ferrari a little while ago, discussing uh, the cost of uh, the cost of materials rising and so on. And I coined a phrase which was Zoom envy. And so that's, that goes into the same thing. People are, are online and they can see, what's, what, see what your background is the whole time. Mm. Um, so, so people are aware of their aesthetics behind them. Mm. So what do you find are the biggest challenges in terms of design these days? Uh, the environmental issues that we have to come up with. Um, we, 20 years ago, a planning application for a major development of 100 or more apartments would fit with the cheque made payable to the local authority into an A4 envelope. Yep. And you get your decision when you've got your decision and you go to a planning committee. Today, you need a rainforest of trees to, uh, to just create the application itself where you have to take account of the environment and, and uh, the different heating systems and so on and so forth. It's, uh, it's, planning is the biggest challenge that we face. Okay. And, and, and the green issues, the green credentials that you have to meet, are they, are they, going, to be, are they going to be punitive in terms of cost on these buildings these days? And again, with everything, the cost is always going to be passed on to the consumer. Mm. Because if we can't 
build that for X pounds per square foot, but it's X plus, we're only going to try and sell it for X plus pounds per square foot. And, and that's that's the issue. So, yes, we've, we've got a green challenge ahead of us as well. OK, I, I, I do worry about this. I mean, I was involved with the development down here some years ago, probably 10 or 12 years ago now. And um, Tower Hamlets made us put in biomass boilers as standby. But then, of course, the developers and the council realised that the storage of the wood chips to, 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 to feed them, these wood chips are combustible, so they therefore were a huge fire risk. So therefore, these biomass boilers got shut down, just absolutely wasted. I think they were something like a million, million and a half pounds each. And they were just never used and never would be used. Um, so I do think we have to get some of this technology right. And I do think we're all over the place on it. I mean, I, th th this business of um, the government giving money now to, uh, 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 to convert boilers. I can't remember how many it was. I, I think it was about 900,000 boilers or something. Yes. Uh, but there's 22 million to do. Exactly. I don't know where we're going with this. Yeah, I, I think it's 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 a headline policy rather than an actual policy that's going to make any difference. Mm. Um, you'll speak about uh, the, the the biomass boilers. We've had the same. We've we've created we've built developments, spent millions of pounds on a, a, a central heating system for the whole scheme, being a biomass boiler, and within time it gets shut down and they go on to the standby unit. It mm. does seem crazy. I think it it's the same as we all went out and bought diesel cars ten years ago because that's what we were told yeah. to do. And now they're the dirtiest cars on the planet. Yeah. So it, it needs a lot more education. From but everybody. all these mistakes are at our cost. Always. It? It's always <laughs> us that pay. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's, that's, that's not a good issue. Um, now, now, coming to um, the cost of buildings and running these buildings, um, I, I've followed your progress uh, in, in, in Galliard for some years now, and I have a great deal of admiration for your, for your ethos. And you're not a company that puts in extravagant swimming pools and all sorts of extras that are actually just going to be a service charge burden yeah. for years and years to come. Um, what, do you, what do you think about this? Do, what, do, what do you think the balance is here? I, th I think there's a, there, there is a balance that has to be found. We've, we've always looked to try and keep the service charge element as low as possible whilst providing the service. And I think um, an actual secure and concierge style service is much more important to the discerning buyer rather than all of the facilities that they end up paying for and never using. Yeah. I I've myself, like you, have probably been based on site at a sales, sales and marketing suite where there's a swimming pool that you could use every day if you wanted or a gym and we never use them. No. And, and and I think they, they don't get used enough and they cost too much money. Well, I, 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 I live across the road here and we've got a huge swimming pool. And I guarantee if I went in today, there'd be nobody else there. Correct, yeah. There'd be nobody else there. And, you know, last year, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of pounds we had to spend out on the service charge to have it renovated and renewed and kept up to spec. Um, so it is a bit of a futile challenge, isn't it? Um, I know the overseas investors in particular that we were talking about earlier do like to see all these facilities because they they see the return in terms of a rental. Correct, yeah. But um, it does come at a huge cost when these guys get a void or, or anything else, don't they? If you've got service charges approaching, say, £10, £12 pounds per square foot, that is a lot of money, a thousand I, square foot. I uh, wish. Yes, you'd, 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 you'd like to be as low as that. We... we that's a magic number for me. When it gets to 10, I start to panic a little bit. Because I just think it's too much. I, I think that's right. You know, a thousand sensible. square foot, that's, that's a lot of money. Okay. A lot of money. Yeah. Well, it's good to see you, you know, taking a view on that because I think, um, I think a lot of young people in particular, um, I, I, I don't for one minute suggest your company does this, but there are companies that falsely keep down the service charge costs in the first couple of years while they're handing everything over. And then, of course, it goes sky high. Now, young people who are um, strength tested anyway on their, their ability to pay yes. their mortgage, they're not strength tested on the service charge going Correct, up. Yeah. And, and, and that can cause a real issue and could cause repossessions. I think... Uh... If you're a company whereby perhaps your sales team is changing every two years, maybe you don't think about it so much because it's the sales team mm. and to therefore my team that will get it in the neck from purchasers who suddenly see their service charge double or even triple. Mm. So we've always tried to be very careful on that line and not and not uh, yeah. not not do that. 
Well, look, um, David, just to just to finish off, I have to tell you that I say I followed your company for some years, and I I think you do a very good job. I see on your website you have buying guides for for young people. You have stamp duty saving schemes that, that again will help first time buyers in particular, and I think you should you know have good credit for that. And I I, I think it's very good that you're taking that responsible attitude. What do you think, though, is your overriding responsibility in today's market as a progressive developer? I think at the end of the day, it still always boils down to value for money. If you can offer that purchaser value for money and an opportunity to get onto the property ladder at a price which, which A, they can afford, and they can afford long term, and B, we've always been an offer-led development company mm. and we've tried to make it so that the purchaser feels that they're getting a bit of value for money uh, and they are getting a bit of value for money. I've got repeat buyers that now go back to 1995 with me who are still purchasing from me because they've done so well over the years. Well, that's testimony enough, isn't it? David Gowman, thank you very much thank for joining you. us today on Property Matters. That's all we've got time for in this, today's show. Join me again next time. I'm Stephen Galpin. See you then.